If you ever cross the Aegean Sea from Athens to the island of Crete, you'll see there the ruins of a royal palace that contains, among other wonders, the oldest throne in Europe. The palace we once knew only from the myths of Minos and Ariadne, the labyrinth and the Minotaur, was excavated a hundred years ago and now stands partially restored, still preserving, after earthquake, fire, and the passage of some thirty-five centuries, fragments of the brightly colored, strikingly modern frescoes that proudly proclaim how brilliant and imaginative Cretan culture once was when it ruled the loud-sounding sea. But long before the palace and its frescoes were unearthed, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart painted that island civilization in music. This is the way the young composer saw it. Pulsing rhythms, luminous colors, exuberant people, splashing seas. This is Father Owen Lee, especially pleased to have been asked by the Metropolitan Opera Guild to speak on Mozart's Idomeneo for this Talking About Opera series, because for 40 years I have taught the Greek and Roman classics. And Mozart's Idomeneo, Re di Creta, Idomeneo, the King of Crete, is based on a story that is at least as old as the commentaries on Roman Virgil and tells of a warrior whose exploits at the Trojan War are as old as Greek Homer. Idomeneo, or Idomeneus, as Homer called him, commanded eighty of the thousand ships that, launched by Helen's beautiful face, sailed to Troy. He is only a supporting actor in the Iliad, and he's fairly well on in years. He's a good fighter, though. His big moment comes in Book 13, when he faces Trojan Aeneas in battle and stands up to him like a mountain boar with bristling back and flaming eyes. And because he is king of Crete, the island kingdom sacred to Neptune, Neptune the glorious earth shaker comes to watch him as he fights. I think it is safe to say that no story in the Western tradition has been told so often and in so many different ways as the vast, burgeoning tale of the Trojan War. It has given birth to countless poems and dramas in many languages, to monumental works of art throughout the ancient world, and from the Renaissance to the present, to hundreds on hundreds of operas. Once, when asked on a metropolitan broadcast quiz to name some operatic sequels and prequels, I cited ten Trojan War operas in sequence. But that was nothing. A recent German study lists, for the 17th century alone, 37 operas on Helen of Troy, 53 on Agamemnon, 52 on Achilles, 57 on Odysseus, 33 on Aeneas, and a full 96 on Dido. And those are just some of the figures connected with the Trojan War. But virtually all of those operas are lost to us now. They were specimens of that 17th century entertainment called opera seria, elaborately baroque serious operas, based on the myths and history of antiquity. Until a few decades ago, 
the opere serie that had survived, including 45 by Handel and two early efforts by the teenaged Mozart, seemed hopelessly dated, even unperformable, for a number of reasons. Many of the leading male roles, even such macho roles as Hercules and Julius Caesar, were sung by Castrati, those superstar male sopranos and altos whose trumpet-like tones were the result of their having been castrated before puberty, incredible as it seems to us today. And, though the stories of opera seria provided such potential for excitement as mythic monsters and historic battles, custom dictated that the music must be a stately succession of long arias isolated by long stretches of recitative and opportunities for vain posturing singers to bow to applause, while the drama inched its formal way towards a happy ending, designed to show the wisdom and clemency of the ruler for whom the opera was commissioned. Small wonder that in Mozart's day, with political revolution and enlightenment philosophies in the 18th century air, and the vile practice of castration for commercial gain fast becoming obsolete, opera seria's days were numbered. Mozart's Idomeneo is, by critical consensus, the greatest opera seria ever written. It is also one of the last. It is opera seria in the process of becoming something new, something much closer to the works that now form the standard repertory in our opera houses. And Mozart being Mozart, it is something extraordinary. Listen to this. There is more chromatic intensity in that passage than anyone ever heard in an opera before. Mozart was 24 in 1780 when the commission came from Munich to write an opera seria. The subject chosen by the court was the story of Idomeneo's return from the Trojan War. A relatively unfamiliar story, it had been set to music in France a half century before, but it fit into a familiar pattern. All the Greek commanders who survived the Trojan War had to face angry gods and disaffected relatives on their return voyages. Odysseus, after fighting the Ten-Year War, had to wander for ten more years, braving monsters and marvels, barely surviving the wrath of the sea god, and when he got home, he had to convince his faithful wife Penelope that he really was her husband. Menelaus was becalmed in Egypt and had somehow to come to terms with his wife, the faithless Helen. Agamemnon unwisely brought a captive Trojan princess home to his palace and was axed in his royal bath by his avenging wife, Clytemnestra. Diomedes was turned out of his island kingdom by his own father. And Idomeneus, Mozart's Idomeneo, was caught in a storm at sea on the journey home to Crete and vowed to his patron god Neptune that if he was spared, he would sacrifice the first living creature he saw on shore. By a terrible twist of fate, the first one to greet him, the victim he was called on to sacrifice, was his own son. It's an archetypal story about fathers and sons, and as Mozart was to develop it, when this father cannot bring himself to slay his son, the son rises heroically to meet the crisis. The young Mozart was eager to write Idomeneo. It was an important commission to compose an opera for the installation of the powerful and enlightened elector of Munich, for the beautiful little Cuvillier Theater there, and for the Mannheim Ensemble, regarded then as the finest orchestra in the world, famous for its virtuoso surges of sound, 
for its breathless pianissimos, for the delicacy of its woodwind playing. Mozart, in his travels, had already met those musicians, and he knew he could write for them music in a German style, orchestral music that would splash and foam like the sea around sea-bound Crete. He also convinced his librettist, Gian Battista Varesco, court chaplain in Salzburg, that their Italian opera seria should incorporate large choral pieces and ensembles in the manner of French lyric tragedy. Idomeneo would be a work that drew in new ways on different musical traditions. We have 36 of the letters that pass between the young composer and his ever-insistent father during the period of the opera's gestation, and we can see that Mozart fought hard to eliminate or at least reduce the effect of the old, mannered, pompous operatic conventions, that he had a hand in the shaping of the libretto, that he was, in effect, the dramatist as well as the composer of Idomeneo. Years later, Mozart's wife, Constanza, said that he always regarded this period as the happiest time of his life, and Idomeneo as the work he loved most of all his works for the stage, perhaps because, after a decade of being idolized as a child prodigy, and then another decade of being studiously ignored by Europe's taste-makers, of having to swallow his pride and submit to the strictures of his father, he finally emerged with this opera as a mature man and a composer of genius. He also changed forever the tradition-bound genre of opera seria. The Munich audience in 1781 must have sensed fairly soon that they were in the presence of something excitingly new. Immediately after the expected courtly opening fanfares, they heard this unexpectedly poignant music from the string section. Then, as befits an opera about a great sea power, the music turns into a churning seascape filled with sturm und drang, with revolutionary, romantic storm and stress. Our orchestra is the Glyndebourne Festival's John Pritchard conducting. <laughs>
The stormy overture subsides, and without giving the audience time for applause, the music segues into the opening recitative, a kind of sung dialogue. And that passes into the first aria without pause, and that moves directly into the next recitative and aria. Mozart wanted Idomeneo to be opera seria that moves. In Act I, we are in the royal palace in Crete, and we see, alone in a hall sacred to Neptune, the Trojan princess Ilia. She is one of many prisoners of war sent ahead to Crete by her captor, Idomeneo. She is still haunted by the fall of her city and the death of her beloved father, King Priam. Ilya, in our recording, is Sena Uranov. And there is another feeling in Ilya's heart, one she cannot understand. When her ship neared the island, she had fallen, or perhaps leapt, into the waters, and the young prince of Crete, Idamande, rescued her. Now, though he is the enemy of her people, she finds she has fallen in love with him. Then Idamante, who holds the reins of power in Crete till his father returns from the war, enters to tell Ilya that he has come to set the Trojan captives free, and that he is determined to help her forget her past sufferings. Mozart was not happy to have been given a castrato for his heroic young prince, and an incompetent castrato at that. Today the role of Idamante is usually sung by a mezzo-soprano. But Mozart, in his own day, recast the role for tenor, and in our recording we are fortunate to have, as Idamante, that prince of Mozart tenors, Leopold Simono. Say to brani al tuo impero, aprirami questo seno, questo seno, e poi lui Suddenly the king's counselor, Arbace, approaches to tell Idamante that his father's ship, nearing the harbor, has been seen going under in a storm. The sun rushes out, hoping against hope, with Ilya following after. And we meet another tormented princess survivor of the Trojan War, 
from the Greek side. She is Agamemnon's daughter Electra, who has found sanctuary in Crete after the murder of her father by her mother, and of her mother by her brother Orestes. Almost maddened by these terrible events, and still imperious, Electra is outraged at the thought that Idamante, a Greek prince, would set captive Trojans free and fall in love with a Trojan slave. She has designs on the prince herself, as Mozart suggests, with orchestral music that stings like sea spray. Our Electra is Lucille Udovic. The scene changes to the rocky sea coast, where the shore is strewn with the wreckage of ships, and the people of Crete are looking out into the storm, as, in the distance, the crew of one last ship is sending frantic cries to heaven. Then, as if heaven has sent a miracle, there is a sudden calm, and Idomeneo comes safely out of the waves. Our shipwrecked king of Crete is Richard Lewis. The king keeps to himself the new fear that gnaws at him. Saved from the storm, he must now keep his vow to sacrifice to the sea god the first victim he lays eyes on. He seems already to see that victim's eyes reproaching him.
Then the king's eyes fall upon his own son, and, devastated, he turns away, exclaiming that it would have been better if his son had never seen him again. The son, uncomprehending, says that the pain of this is too much for him. The act ends with the people rejoicing and the father and son utterly silent. I've always found the first act of Idomeneo a little formal. The recitatives overextended, the arias repetitive. But something unusual, indeed unprecedented, starts to happen as early as the overture and gathers force the clashing, descending phrase that cuts through the opening measures. Soon evolves into a recurrent theme that underscores the action in scene after scene. It is one of the earliest examples of the kind of thematic recurrence that a century later with Wagner was to be called the leitmotif. Mozart's theme, scarcely more at the start than a downward blast of massed strings, a slurred five-note phrase, comes to dominate the subsiding of the storm. Then, as Ilya remembers the fall of Troy, the theme sounds in the lower orchestra like a fleeting ghost, a bitter memory. It sounds again in the pulsing bass accompaniment to Ilya's aria, as she wonders how she could ever have fallen in love in captivity with one of the enemy. It recurs in the woodwinds, bright with hope, when Idamante assures Ilya that he will help her forget her past sufferings. It reappears quietly on the upper strings as King Idomeneo comes safely to land. And, sorrowing in the woodwinds, it accompanies the king's realization that now 
he will have to answer for his rash vow. And when the son cannot understand why his father turns away from him, it sounds again. That descending theme will recur in further transformations throughout the opera. We may think of leitmotivic recurrence as the special property of Wagner, but the beginnings of it are unmistakably here. In fact, Richard Strauss, editing Idomeneo for audiences raised on Wagner, noted several more recurrent themes in Mozart's score, and even presumed to emphasize them by rewriting some of the recitatives. There are other innovations in Idomeneo. The solo attitudes of older opera seria permitted little, if any, interaction between the characters. There were few duets, next to no ensembles, and sometimes no choral singing. But with Mozart's Idomeneo, with his artful segues, his less stylized, more dramatic arias, his powerful choruses, and, as we shall see, his breakthrough ensembles, with all of these propelling the drama, we can feel the old Baroque tradition giving way to something new. In Act Two, Mozart, surer now of what he wants to do, rises to new musical heights. We hear from number to number intimations of the famous operas he would write after this one. Some time has passed. In the throne room of his palace, the grieving king finally confides to his counselor Arbace what he has told to no one else, that because of his rash vow, he must sentence his own son to death. Arbace advises him instead to send the prince away, far from Neptune's domain, to a land where a different god will protect him. Some other victim can be found in Crete to satisfy Neptune. Idomeneo, still fearful, decides to send the young man to the mainland of Greece. He can sail there with Electra and help her reclaim her kingdom. Meanwhile, Ilia, knowing nothing of this plan, has come to love Idomeneo as a father. The gentle Trojan, who has lost her own father, sings to the man who took her captive, I have forgotten my past sorrows. You are my father now. Her aria looks forward ten years to the tender pieces sung by Tamino and Pamina in the magic flute. And, like a famous piece Mozart would write for the heroine of the abduction from the Seraglio, Ilya's aria here has prominent parts for four solo instruments. Mozart's friends from Mannheim in the orchestra.
Idomeneo realizes now that Ilya is in love with his son and that the vow he has made will bring misery to them all. Over a surging orchestra, he sings that the storm in his heart is as devastating as the storm he faced at sea. Predictably, in the second measure of his aria, the descending theme appears in the orchestra and later in the vocal line. Electra is overjoyed that she will be restored to her country under the protection of Prince Idamante. She is sure that there he will come to return her love. For the space of an aria, it almost seems that Agamemnon's fiery daughter is capable of gentleness. Then we move from the palace to the seashore, to the sound of a charming march that might have come out of Mozart's Figaro. But for this classicist, it seems to conjure up not a wedding procession in a Spanish country palace, but a parade of almond-eyed, bare-breasted maidens in flounced skirts, and proud sun-tanned youths bearing golden cups, like those depicted in the frescoes of the royal palace of Crete. The sea is radiantly calm, and the people sing an iridescent chorus as Electra prepares to board the ship.
The young prince, still not knowing why his father is sending him away, asks for a blessing. Then, in two moments almost unprecedented in opera seria, moments that look forward to Mozart's Don Giovanni, Idamante, Idomeneo, and Electra voice their three conflicting emotions simultaneously in a trio. And then that trio reaches an altogether unexpected climax. Neptune, in his anger over the unkept vow, has sent, through a torrent of sea spray, a monster from the deep to terrorize the kingdom of Crete. This is a moment that older opera seria, with its long tradition of mythic happenings, would have exploited musically and scenically. Mozart tries for something new, something subtler. The people flee in fear, the storm subsides, and the monster seems to be hovering out of sight. The act ends quietly, with a change in the music from minor to major. Ordinarily, such a change would be reassuring. Here, it is strangely unsettling. Before we turn to Act Three, a word about orchestral color. The Mannheim Ensemble that Mozart wrote this opera for produced effects that were compared in their day to a thundering cataract, a vernal breath, a crystal stream murmuring as it evanesces into the distance. I always think of Mozart's stormy Aegean as gray-green, streaked with silver for the salt splashes. Homer sometimes calls the sea gray. And I hear the calms on Mozart's sea as clear blue, though very often in Homer the Aegean is wine dark. But certainly one of the very special aspects of Idomeneo is its attention to such coloring. Via swirling strings, muted horns, mass trombones, and especially woodwinds in dialogue. You will want to decide for yourself what colors are suggested from moment to moment 
by the orchestration in Idomeneo, which was for its day orchestration of a wholly new loveliness. I might add that the oldest throne in Europe, still in place after thousands of years in the royal palace in Crete, is set before frescoes of blue and white papyrus reeds and yellow-red griffins, that the queen's chambers there are adorned with gray-green dolphins convorting in an eggshell blue sea, that elsewhere in the palace we see a leaping brown-red bull with yellow horns, a blue monkey gathering saffron crocuses in a field of fuchsia, and decorations of green olive sprays and white lilies. I'd like some day to see a production that reproduces some of these interiors and stages the final scene in front of the grand staircase of the palace with its distinctively tapered russet-colored columns. The Met production by Jean-Pierre Ponel is in the patented off-white and sepia neoclassic style of his other Mozart stagings, dominated by a huge, open-mouthed, oracular face of Neptune, on which scenes of monumental classic architecture are projected. Perhaps rightly, the massive monochrome production leaves it to Mozart's orchestra to paint in the colors. In the third act of Idomeneo, virtually every number can rank with the greatest music Mozart ever wrote. First, in the palace garden, there is Ilya's song to the winds, the aria, a plaintive blending of German and Italian musical traditions, is scored for the Mannheim strings, flutes, clarinets, bassoon, and French horn. Choose your colors. Suddenly Idamante arrives to tell Ilya of the monster, which he is now resolved to face with drawn sword. Mozart wrote two duets for the lovers here, one for Munich and its castrato Idamante, another for Vienna and its tenor. Here is a fragment of the latter. The lovers blend their voices for the first time in the opera. Then the king surprises the lovers and commands his son to leave the island forever. Electra also appears, filled with jealousy and rage, and Mozart gives us the number he was proudest of in the score, the quartet Andro Ramingo e Solo. Where Handel would have given us four separate arias, replete with repetitions, 
Mozart gives us four characters caught in four different emotions, blending their voices simultaneously. It is the first great ensemble in opera's history, a piece that looks forward to the quartet in Fidelio, the quintet in Die Meistersinger, and the sextet in Don Giovanni. The counselor Arbace approaches with the terrible news that plague has come upon the city, and we move to a great courtyard open to sky and sea, where the high priest of Neptune shows the king his people dying in agony. Why does he not tell the city why the god is angry? Why does he not perform the necessary sacrifice? Idomeneo, in broken phrases, finally confesses to his people that the victim he must sacrifice is his own son, la vittima e idemande. This is the most poignant recurrence of the descending theme. Oh, dear. La vittima e idemande. Then comes a chorus that would not sound out of place in Mozart's last unfinished work, the Requiem. But in fact, it's the young Mozart coming into the fullness of his powers, challenging and changing the opera of the past. It's the great forward-moving chorus, O Voto Tremendo.
1982, the Metropolitan Opera hoped with its premiere production of Idomeneo to establish the long-neglected opera firmly in the repertory. It's doubtful that that would have been possible without the participation of a great star singer, and the management found one in Luciano Pavarotti, who generously undertook a role that did not require the high B-flats and C's his public most wanted to hear. The amazing thing is that the moment when Luciano won that public over was the moment when, without singing a note, he took the stage majestically sorrowful during this poignant ceremonial march. As his priests prepare for the sacrifice, Idomeneo kneels in prayer. Suddenly, trumpets announce that Idamante has slain the beast from the sea. In a moment, the prince is there, fully aware now of his father's vow, and ready to submit to the death that will make the ultimate payment to the angry god and bring peace to the people. He submissively bows his head. Idomeneo, steeled to the act he must perform, raises the sword and finds his hand stayed by the gentle Ilya, who has rushed forth to die in place of the one she loves. At that moment, the earth quakes, and the voice of Neptune is heard, solemnly announcing that Idomeneo, for his failure to keep his vow, must yield his crown. The powerful god who presides over Crete has found in the nobility and self-sacrifice of the two lovers the ones who will rightly rule his island in the future. Idamante, the voice decrees, is to succeed to the throne with Ilya as his queen. Mozart insisted that this supernatural manifestation, a deus ex machina solution all too typical of older opera seria, be kept as brief and believable as possible. And instead of following the announcement with the customary general rejoicing, he wrote a tragic aria for the jealous Electra, whose mind cracks as her schemes come to nothing. 
It is a piece that Donna Anna might sing in all her fury in Don Giovanni. We are given to know that, though peace has been restored to the island kingdom of Crete, the aftermath of the Trojan War still affects the war's other victims. Electra feels within her breast the rage of the Furies that once drove her brother Orestes to madness. But at least peace has come to Idomeneo's realm, and to his heart as well. Torna la pace, the father sings, as he yields his throne to his heroic son. This is an aria in one of Mozart's radiant keys, B-flat. I can't hear it without thinking ten years ahead to his last and most spacious piano concerto, also in B-flat. Amazingly, the young Mozart was persuaded by those responsible for the overlong Munich premiere to cut these last two arias, and the deplorable tradition of continuing those cuts continues in many theaters to this day, when a common-sense overview of the score would dictate that any cuts to be made should come from the obligatory ballet music that follows Torna la Pace or from the still somewhat tentative first act. I'm also a little sorry that Mozart ends the innovative opera with a rather conventional chorus. For the 21st century opera lover still steeped in 19th century repertory, that is to say, for most of us, there are undeniable difficulties in Idomeneo. The opening situation, so reminiscent of that in Verdi's Aida, a young warrior in love with a captive princess jealously regarded by a powerful princess, is never developed dramatically. Thanks to Mozart, the two women are effectively contrasted in their arias. But thanks to Varesco, those arias are ineffectively placed in the drama. And Ilya's heroic intervention in Act Three, which should be the high point of the action 
as a similar situation is at the climax of Beethoven's Fidelio, is rendered not in the intensely dramatic music of which Mozart was by now capable, but in relatively unintense recitative. The young genius still had a way to go. After Idomeneo, Mozart, always experimenting, proceeded quickly, there was so little time, to write, among his hundreds of other works, symphonies, concertos, string quartets, and sacred music, that remarkable series of musical dramas in which he virtually recreated opera by blending the old opera seria with other types of music for the stage, with lowly German Zinkspiel in the abduction from the seraglio and the magic flute, and with Italian opera buffa in the marriage of Figaro, Don Giovanni, and Così fan tutte. All of those masterpieces combine the serious and the comic in unprecedented ways. Only in his last year did Mozart write, on commission from the royal court in Prague, a final opera seria, La Clemenza di Tito. And that work restructured the supposedly moribund genre so beautifully that for 40 years after Mozart's death, it was his most popular opera, beloved by Goethe, Stendhal, and Mörike. But inevitably, with the emergence in Europe of nationalist and anti-monarchist sentiments, with the stormy advent of Romanticism, with Teutonic rather than Greek myth thundering on the world's opera stages, and with Verismo violence on the horizon, opera seria fell into oblivion, and Di Domineo and La Clemenza di Tito went virtually unperformed for a hundred and fifty years. It is only in the last few decades, as interest in all periods of opera intensified, that Mozart's two serious operas have been seen for the masterpieces they are. And thereby hangs a tale. In his book, In Defense of Opera, Hamish Swanston tells the true story of an African bodyguard, a giant of a man, recruited to accompany the president of a developing country to a conference in Geneva. The African knocked at midnight on the door of a Swiss professor of law to ask what that wonderful music was playing on the gramophone. Fascinated, he stayed on into the night to listen to the professor's recording, and eventually he took it back with him to his African village. The music that bridged the culture gap that night was Idomeneo. The work that spoke with directness to the African was a work that the theaters of Europe and America had laid aside for a hundred and fifty years. So tenacious was the idea on those continents that opera seria was dead. The African instinctively knew better. Perhaps more in touch with myth and its wonders he could hear in Idomeneo something that we in the Western tradition could no longer hear. The story of a father divinely called to sacrifice his own child is an archetypal story, told of those biblical fathers, Abraham and Jephthah, of Agamemnon and Meander in Greek myth, and of fathers in the myths of many other civilizations. It could strike pity and fear into a heart that was open to it. It is also a story that was intensely personal to the young man who wrote the wonderful music the African heard. Mozart's own father was soon, like Idomeneo, to relinquish his stern control over his son's life. And Mozart, like young Idamante, was soon to come into his rightful kingdom into the fullness of his musical powers. No wonder Mozart wanted to write Idomeneo. No wonder that of all his operas it was closest to his heart. And no wonder it is full of what the African called wonderful music. <laughs>